Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our third session this term in Sound Arts Visiting Practitioner Lecture Series. This is the first one which we are attempting to do completely live, so it's quite exciting. Um, but Aditya has been embracing the spirit of live <laughs> virtual lecturing. Um, yeah, so maybe just a prior warning that the quality may not be completely perfect throughout, but we have the excitingness of being completely live. What we're going to do is post links um, to the files, which um, Buddhaditya has um, all online on SoundCloud and Vimeo, so both the sound and video files. So should you have kind of dropouts when we're watching, you can go back and watch them and listen to them at a later date. OK, great. So um, as is traditional, we'll have a lecture of around 90 minutes in which Buddhaditya will be um, telling us about his work. I'm really excited. And then we'll have hopefully a good uh, 20 to 30 minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, and you're all welcome to um, ask questions either by raising your hand and I can enable you to turn on your microphone or you can type your questions in the chat forum and I can read them out for you. Um, I think that's it. Is there anything else from housekeeping? I think that's about it. So hopefully you can all hear me. Um, and I'll just introduce Buddhaditya and then we can start. So uh, Buddhaditya Chattopadhyay is a contemporary artist, researcher and writer incorporating diverse media such as sound, text and moving image. Chattopadhyay produces works for large scale installation and live performance addressing contemporary issues of climate crisis, human intervention in the environment and ecology, urbanity, migration, race and decolonization. Chattopadhyay has been a Charles Wallace Scholar and a Prince Klaus grantee. He has received numerous fellowships, residencies and international awards. His works have been widely exhibited, performed or presented across the globe. Chattopadhyay's writings regularly appear on peer-reviewed journals, magazines and other publications internationally with two books forthcoming. Um, Chattopadhyay holds a PhD in Artistic Research and Sound Studies from the Academy of Creative and Performing Arts Leiden University and an MA in Media Communication and Cultural Studies from Aarhus University and he recently completed a one-year postdoctoral fellowship. So a really big welcome to you Buddhaditya, it's such a pleasure to have you. Um, yeah, just also on a personal note, um, we kind of came across each other uh, a few years ago and came into contact. So it's a real pleasure that we've opened this lecture series up to people who are not just in London to come and, and um, talk to our students. So yeah, thank you so much for coming and um, looking forward very much to your talk. So we're all ears. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I welcome you uh, online from my current location in near Tallinn in Estonia, where I'm kind of stranded because of lockdown. I'm here from last February, and uh, I don't know how long I'll be staying here. I think until the end of this month. So welcome. Thanks for uh, being here. And uh, I just would like to uh, kind of divide the talk between two different sections. One would be uh, giving a brief introduction to my body of work so far. And secondly, talking about some uh, conceptual premise uh, entry points and uh, my reading of contemporary sound art uh, practices in general. So the name of the, the title of the talk is towards a post immersive or discursive situation in sound art we'll go deeper into these uh, phrases, words, alphabets. I would like to begin with uh, the coming of sound, my coming to sound practice in general. Uh, when I was eight, my sister gave me a cassette recorder, National Panasonic. Uh, I also got a number of blank tapes 
So I started recording. I first, uh, I was recording the voice of my mother and also noticing how the space, the room, um, which the sound was occurring, the voice of my mother was recorded when I was coming a bit away from the object itself, her singing. And this interplay between the object of sound and the room or the context or the environment within which the object, object is posited, this interplay was something that uh, I found as my entry point to sound practice in general. And through the trajectory of my body of work, I have been continuously responding to this question of this in interconnection between or interrelationship between space, a context, sound object, and the mediation process. Mediation through different kind of technological interventions such as tape, uh, disc, vinyl, or cinema, or internet, different kinds of media. And through different kinds of media, mediation continuously is taking place and taking sound, changing it, transforming it in, in different ways. So um, in when I was in high school in, in 2000, uh, we had a, we our house was underwater for three days, three nights. Uh, we had a huge collection of discs, vinyls, uh, spool reel-to-reel -reel tapes, cassettes, and those collections were underwater. You can imagine how uh, heartbroken I was. And uh, then for one or two years, I started to salvage the uh, recording, some of the tapes or vinyls. Vinyls were easier. I, I was cleaning them and tapes, I uh, opened them up and then was cleaning with some uh, alcohol-based uh, liquids. And this process took me into the sound engineering uh, realm. So I decided to study sound in after school and I applied for the National Film School and I got in. And from 2003 to 2007, I was studying sound recording and sound design. So these two anecdotes are easier uh, for you to understand my coming of sound and my coming to sound, my coming of age, uh, practicing sound. The first work I published was Landscape in Metamorphosis in 2008. It was a result of a, a series of ethnographical intervention I made in India, actually a place that turned from a tribal habitat to uh, industrial zone. And I, I think we can listen to a bit of the a little clip from the publication. It was published by Green Recorder on CD.
um, landscaping metamorphosis was based on uh, ethnographic research in a tribal dominated area in Southeast Asia, South Asia. Um, most of the locations were undergoing transformation from uh, indigenous population to industrial zone and special industry using displacement and dispossession. So this piece was kind of uh, lamentation uh, responding to the displacement of the tribal habitat that I have uh, visited and researched. I came back to those areas uh, again in another work, Decomposing Landscape. Uh, I will play a little clip from Decom Decomposing Landscape later on. The eye contact with the city was a result of an artist residency I did uh, in Bangalore between 2010 and 11. And I recorded uh, the industrial zones of the city as well as the material constructions that was taking place at that time. And also I uh, researched the archives, the public archives and found tapes, uh, old tapes from 1940s and uh, 50s. And the room tones that I found on those tapes were the third layer of the composition. So the composition was titled Elegy for Bangalore, but it was also an audiovisual installation and that was exhibited uh, in a number of occasions. And second time it was uh, taking place uh, at the Arts Electronica where it got an award in 2011 in Linz, Austria. Elegy for Bangalore was a publication, the release uh, in the form of a CD again with green recorder. Dismantling a sound work in six easy steps was my first solo exhibition uh, at Akusmata Gallery in Helsinki. Uh, the exhibition uh, to make, made use of the materials I gathered during the making of uh, 
Bangalore. Uh, it was six channel four installation and I was in Bangalore that was my first time in the city uh, next year I came back because I was interested to explore the city a bit farther uh, between 11 and 12 2011 and 2012 uh, I gathered materials for another work which was commissioned by the Museum Reina Sofia Madrid uh, for the second uh, interaction with the city, I developed uh, a piece called the Well-Tempered City, which was actually a measurement of the city, different uh, urban sites, the vibration response of the different buildings that was generated through the, uh, the user or the citizens' interaction with them, such as rail, rail stations, different fences, and uh, construction sites. The surfaces of those buildings and constructions were generating vibrations through the interaction of the citizen. So what I was measuring is, was actually the way citizens were interacting with the city continuously in everyday life. Like walking, tapping, uh, different kinds of interaction, physical interactions with, with the city. So, um, well, temperature city was measured using a hacked instrument that is, you know, accelerometers. Accelerometers are used to measure vibrations. So I hacked the accelerometer to make a, it a kind of a microphone, spatial microphone. So I used a number of accelerometers to uh, decipher the physically or anthropogenically inaudible vibrations of the city. We can listen to the clip, I guess. Well-tempered city, a little clip from the piece, which was composed 
uh, on 5.1 first version, and then an ambisonic uh, composition. It was not released yet, but it is available uh, because it, it was funded by Rhino Maria Radio in Madrid. They have the work in their collection. Passage to the City was exhibited in a number of positions. One was in, in Trondheim in Norway. Passage to the City was developed a uh, theology of understanding the resonant frequency response of a particular place. It was developed using a mic microphone array and uh, active speaker and acrobatic movement between them. So the feedback was generated, a number of layers of feedbacks. So you worked with this, these feedbacks in the passage to the city. So uh, Mind Your Own Dizziness was uh, my first exhibition. It was exhibited in Nolan, Copenhagen in a test version, but it was, uh, we have a video which we can play you know, just a few seconds later. It is a site responsive exhibition with number of speakers which captures the ambience of the, that location where they are posited and they play it back. Perhaps we can listen to the sound and also watch the video. It was Transmedia Le Festival in Berlin 2013, 2014, sorry. Next work was Decomposing Landscape. Decomposing Landscape, like Landscape in Metamorphosis, was based on displacement and disposition of indigenous people through the industrialization of land. And uh, this is a particular uh, trade of my work responding to the environmental decay, Anthropocene, and the particularly affected by, uh, by the industrialization and development at wrong, or I would argue a wrong mo model of development, 
profit-based development that is affecting the world today and particularly the vulnerable communities such as the tribal habitat. Since I grew up in my boyhood in the tribal dominated area, I have a kind of soft spot for indigenous habitat and the, the livelihood, particular way of living. And uh, therefore, uh, many in my many of my works, I come back to this idea of of how to effectively engage the audience and the listener to the predicament of indigenous populace. Decomposing landscape uh, was released by Touch, uh, a very well-known label, in ambisonic comp as an ambisonic composition. And also, it was exhibited in, in, in a number of occasions. For example, it was live performed in Donau Festival in Krems in 2015, and uh, exhibited in 2017 at Quartet uh, Contemporary Art Initiative in Den Haag, in solo exhibition, my first solo exhibition in Netherlands. Then in 2018, with VR, uh, number of VR gears were incorporated in the exhibition because the work also had a VR component with responsive audio, eight channel audio and six channel video. So a few images from decomposing landscape in Weltkunstzimmer in Dusseldorf, 2018. Perhaps we can listen to the sound clip from decomposing landscape. Decomposing landscape. Uh, the work uh, has different 
dissemination methods, particularly uh, an, an ambisonic composition published by Touch and a VR work, which is available from uh, in VR space in Berlin, their website, and also available for uh, different exhibition iterations. 2016, uh, I performed at Helicat Trauma Festival in, in Venice, uh, titled Arithmetic of Distance, a series of works I'm still continuing. Exile and Other Syndromes, a work I, it's very close to my, I would say my heart, because it is a result of my 12 years of living in Europe as such. I was very much attracted to the different what is called dehumanizing spaces, or Mark Oge uh, wrote a book called Non Places. So the, no, those non places in European cities, because I found in European cities, they're in abundance, non places such as big construction sites, basements, abandoned rail stations, electrical generating plants, and so on and so forth, uh, airports, for example. Exile and other syndromes was developed in between 2015 and 2016 uh, when I was an artist in residence at IEM, University of Music and Performing Arts in Graz. Exile and other syndromes was a multi channel ambisonic composition for live performance and installation with generative visuals. The visuals are uh, the notes I took during the recordings of, of, of those locations, as well as the effect they have uh, after sound is passing through them. So it's an intimate interaction between the text ethnographic notes that I generated while inter interacting with those locations, as well as the sounds from those locations. It's, it's a generative composition. We can listen to first the uh, little clip from the audio and then perhaps uh, watch one small video clip. We have a clip, a video clip from Exile and Other Syndromes project from a night festival in Leiden.
next project uh, that I developed from 2017 was Expanded Object. In the first version, it was titled uh, Talking Frame. Talking Frame was developed during uh, a time I spent at ZKIM Curl Studio. It was a direct response to the question that whether sound can be exhibited as an artistic object. So I developed a number of photographic canvases which are site responsive and which are generating uh, sound sequences, impulses from it, its interaction with the environment itself. So there is nothing so so-called uh, visual representation of sound on the canvas itself, but it is a sound generating object. So to demonstrate that sound spills over of any, any visual representation, it like to frame it. So there is an interaction between uh, the idea of sound object, uh, but it is questioned all the time as sound is uh, traveling from the object itself to the viewer and on the, on the travel itself is changing its character. It was exhibited in a number of locations, venues, and uh, finally 2019 to 2020, it was exhibited at the ACPMI alma mater where I did my uh, doctoral study and uh, I defended my PhD at ACPA Leiden in the ground floor basement exhibition space for their students and alumni. We have a video clip. Perhaps we can uh, play the video clip right now. That was expanded object project, one uh, version of the expanded object project. And the next version will have 16 of those canvases. All of them are equipped with uh, small uh, Arduino, a Raspberry Pi, and sensors, ambient sensors, that translates the environments within which uh, each canvas is posited and play them back uh, in a in a, like a composition. The current work, uh, a number of works I'm involved uh, with. Uh, one of them is Towards an Amicable End, which is a generative composition. Uh, I would like to release the first version of the work in uh, this year, 2020. I'd like to play a little clip from the composition.
that was uh, towards an amicable end, an ongoing project that I also collaborate with a, with a number of musicians on different instruments, double bass, uh, electric guitar, and other instruments. Because it's an instrument-based work, and for the first time, I'm working with a particular uh, instrument in the classical genre, uh, double bass and violin, and using a data, a live data, uh, climate variables, live climate variables, uh, augmenting with the instrumentation. So it's a live interaction with the instrumentation, the live performance, improvisation with climate data towards an amicable end. Machine poetry was one exhibition I did uh, in 2019 at Akusmata. It was another work which is interested about knowing the relationship between sound, the location, and the poetics, the, the way we reconnect with places. Often we feel that we are uh, estranged or we are kind of disconnected from a particular location. If, if you, you are in a migratory condition, like an immigrant or a refugee, you often take time to develop a relationship with the place where you are. So in, in, in an immigrant situation, I have been traveling all over the world and continuously uh, traversing different locations and often I didn't find the possibility to connect with the place but feel a, the situatedness that I was aspiring but uh, one way to connect with the place was through the contemplation that is generated through this interaction so machine poetry is about the generation of thoughts and stream of consciousness through technological interaction as well. So my phone, uh, my machine, uh, machinic devices such as recorders, cameras, so the way they generate continuous flow of data. And uh, often there is there are poetics embedded in, in these kind of interactions. The machine poetry was exhibited at uh, Kusmata in 2019, and it will be again exhibited at ICA this year in Montreal. This interest in poetics, sonic or media poetics, the way medial experience, they have uh, poetic uh, moments hidden inside, uh, was taking different shapes. One was a particular series of works that will be published by Iran Bodhi's Praise. It's a series of texts and sounds uh, that I also perform from. I would like to read a little piece from the nomadic listener, which is um, uh, one of the outcomes of this series of performances and writings, exhibitions, uh, examining the relationship between sound and poetics and migration or mobility as such. It was uh, written number 49 it was written during my stay in, uh, brief stay in Beirut between 2018 and 2019. The eluding history of sound is embedded in the silence of the sounding object. The ambient architecture of time unfolds in these in-between spaces. Ghostly remnants of voices deceased long ago now circles around the oblivion of the present moment. Primordial surfaces that survive the humanly celebration of forgetting still absorb the recurring shadows of sound. Stream of water drops. Abandoned air echoes inside the unfinished dome of a disappearing prospect. One who steps into this maze of coalescing time is greeted with an acoustic mirror. Every voice uttered and every breath exhaled reflects back again and again to haunt the brewing of effervescent memories. Sounds do not want to leave. They circle around the solitary self like 
hungry balls of fire. As one sound tends to eat the other, together they explode inside the listening mind as triggers for awe, fear, and hallucination. The reverberation then captures the body like an expanded flame. The reclining figure cannot disengage from the reenactment of sounding as a hyper listener. It starts participating in the tragic rituals of echolocating the end. A selection of 60 uh, of, of those texts and sound recordings will be published by Iran Bodies Press, my first book. Um, although not scholarly as such, but as a series of a collection of creative writings around sound will be published by Aaron Bodies Press in June 2020. Dhwani, uh, a project I am working on at the moment is an AI and machine learning driven exhibition. I'd like to play a little clip from Dhwani. Uh, it was exhibited in the Experimental Festival in France this year in February. That was my last exhibition. Dhwani was uh, developed from an interest in uh, traditional ritual sounding objects and how they can brought back to a contemporary realm of automation. So we worked with artificial intelligence to, uh, to generate the vibrations, compensating for the vibration of the bell themselves. They are temple bells, different versions, uh, different uh, sizes. Uh, the next version of Dhoni will have uh, larger bells. At this point, we worked with smaller bells, as you can hear. That is the end of uh, a, brief, a brief, in a nutshell, my an introduction to my body of work so far, a selection of works, not all, but a few. So as you uh, could perhaps, understood that uh, in the beginning, I started with recording sound on location. And uh, through last 12 years of working with sound, I have developed a sense of, uh, I'm still looking for a language, but different interests uh, are driving me. One is artificial intelligence, generative systems, production, site specificity, migration, disappearance of uh, traditional objects, sounds, 
displacement of indigenous people under the specter of development and growth and anthropogenic intervention in the environment. So these are different interests. I'd like to now contextualize my practice within a contemporary discourse. Connecting Resonances uh, is a book project that I'm working on. If this is my post, I just uh, show you a little bit of the clip, uh, Bunny, which is asking uh, for uh, the conflict or equalizing between tradition and modernity, questioning the modern, modernist approach and the kind of power structures developed through this interaction between traditional um, societies, indigenous societies, and the uh, imposition of modernist technologies in them. So Dhoni is actually an, an outcome of this research, how traditional sounding objects can be reinterpreted within the machine realm, machine vision. So I have been conducting workshops in different situations and contexts. One was during my postdoctoral position in Beirut, the first workshop, Connecting Resonances, with Brandon Labelle from Bergen uh, University, music department. Then I conducted a workshop uh, at the University of Cologne music department. The third workshop from this series was taking place at the Faculty of Music, uh, UCLA. Connecting Resonances will be published as a book in 2020. So uh, this is one thread of my I'm practicing sound studies, sound art studies. Another thread is an interest in atmosphere ambience. My first scholarly book will be out in 2021 from Edinburgh University Press, titled The Connecting Resonances, uh, titled The Auditory Setting, sorry. Auditory Setting, Environmental Sounds in Film and Media Arts. I just finished the manuscript recently. I'd like to show you uh, I'd also like to read a little passage from the book. I'll just show you the workshops I conducted in the relationship uh, with the research as, uh, as an outcome of my doctoral dissertation, Audible Absence. Yes, this, this was the uh, first workshop I conducted in Beirut uh, while I was a postdoctoral fellow there about atmosphere and it to social formation and how meditation changes the atmosphere from um, location based to kind of anthropogenic real. And this series of uh, will also be covered uh, in the publication. I'll read a little a clip from the book. When I was seven years old, I once got lost in the forest. I had been following my father, who walked faster than me, on our way through the trees behind our house to meet someone. At a certain point, I realized that I couldn't hear my father's footsteps in front of me, sounds that I had been tracing while looking around in curiosity. I had been taken by the sunlight as it played on the leaves and butterflies as they passed by in solemn unison with the green leaves and dark trees bran tree branches. Then I found myself alone, the murmurs of wind blowing through leaves and the friction between movement and stasis had already drowned out my father's footsteps, my lone sonic navigational tool in the forest. Their absence accentuated other sounds, the intimate whispering wind carrying news of fallen leaves its intensity and proximity suddenly sounded ominous and dreadful. Surrounded by this maze of sound, I lost my sense of orientation and security. I wanted to escape this estranging sonic immersion to find familiar voices that would ground me. By retracing my footsteps, I gradually found a way out of the vibrating forest. My guiding force had been a heightened relationship with the forest sound world and my isolation. Ambient sounds and the reflection of my own anxious voice amongst the dense trees 
had allowed me to get through the labyrinthian green and escape. Much later, I went back and recorded the forest. The recordings recalled my childhood memories of a maze-like space. This time, however, clarity prevailed. The leaves still moved at their own pace and the murmur still whispered in my ears. The tree branches still cried out in pain while moving in the gentle breeze. But they didn't sound oppressive. They sounded present and assuring. Perhaps my listening has come of age, bringing with it maturity in sonic navigation through forest-like sites. This is from the chapter Forest and Jungle. The auditory setting, the book, will be divided into different chapters. Uh, the part three uh, into different chapters, there are generic locations such as forest, jungle, uh, island, balcony, different kinds of locations which are natural or semi-natural or human, human anthropogenic. So I'd like to, uh, what I'm doing in the book is finding different examples of films and audio uh, based media art projects where this kind of locations has been exposed. So I'm uh, analyzing those examples and uh, relating them to my own lived experience of those locations. So this is the book that will be uh, published in 2020-21. Through my uh, artistic projects and writings and research, I have been trying to respond to a number of questions. What is the lineage of sound art? Is it from music, visual art, performing arts, media arts? This is my first question that I uh, continuously deal in my work. Can sound as a medium or phenomenon be exhibited as an artistic object? Contemporary sound artworks, site-based ethnography and recording outside a studio made at specific sites with various social, cultural, and anthropological resonances. How much spatial information is retained and how much sonic modulations are deployed in the production process of the works? How are the site-specific sounds, sonic atmospheres or ambiances used and retreated in the production process? This is uh, a question I'm responding to in my book of the auditory setting. Does immersive uh, sound and uh, music works hinder the analytical faculty of the listener? Can sound artworks be more environmentally, socially, and politically alert and active? What are the roles of the listener? To participate in, intervene into, or activate a sound artwork. What are the emerging perspectives in sound art? These are the six questions that emerge from my own practice, and I'm continuously dealing with these questions, trying to respond in my own capacity, in my research, artistic works. These are the kind of uh, distilled uh, artistic research approach in my work as an artist and researcher. I'll now go to respond to the first question, the lineage of sound art. Intense discussion within the art world about the perception and it interpretation of the notion of sound art followed a show at the Museum of New York titled Soundings, a Contemporary Score 2013. It was a collection of sculptures, video pieces, installations, and work on paper with audio components. Rather than framing sound as medium, event, or corporeal vibration, this show, a first of its kind at MoMA, explored sound with a strong emphasis on its material and object-based visual dimension. To artists, critics, and thinkers alike, 
this show accelerated the otherwise dormant debates around sound arts position within gallery and museum dominated mainstream public showcasing of contemporary art. It suggests a deep confusion and uncertainty about how sound art is defined. The central question is, can sound be exhibited as an artistic object within a gallery? Is the, is the idea of a sound art exhibition not problematic, considering the nature of sound as a predominantly ephemeral and immaterial phenomenon? This very question complicates the positioning of sound art in the contemporary field of artistic and curatorial practices. Demanding a new set of theoretical approaches and methodologies. In this talk, while delineating and contextualizing my work as an artist, the question is in relation to sound art, shifting the focus to listening experiences. The ambivalence surrounding sound art history stems from the fact that. More often than not, sound art has been framed within the showcasing of the visual arts. The problem in this taxonomy lies in the fact that there are basic and fundamental differences between oral and visual representations that we cannot ignore. Sound can be perceived as mysterious and ineffable, transient and ephemeral, or Im immediate and indeterminate in comparison to its implied visual counterparts, the artistic objects that are visible in relation to diffusion of sound in space. Therefore, sound art as a term cannot exist in a representational vacuum due to its inherent characteristics. As scholars such as Labelle states, it seems sound art continues to hold an unsettled place within artistic institutions which could be said to unearth the impasse between an overtly visual institutional structure with an intensely sonic medium. He mentions in this respect the comments of curator Bern Schulz, quote, the, uh, in, the inexpressibility and cognitive impenetrability of the phenomenal experience make it difficult to secure the secure for sound art the place it deserves in the world. Kim Cohen describes sound art as the unwanted child of music. This is a telling uh, perspective. He has pointed out the boundaries, tendencies, and specific shifts in post-war music, experimental music in particular, practices after Pierre Schaeffer's experiments with music concrete and John Kidd's experiments with silence. He also located a conceptual turn in the ensuing field of sound art, which, which is coin sound art. Following the scholarships in sound and sight, such as Murray Schaeffer's work at Simon Fraser University, terms such as soundscape and acoustic ecology were used to describe specific sound practices embedded with strictly environmental aesthetics. However, these practices with recorded and composed soundscapes were inherently constrained within predominantly musical structures and ecological con concerns and did not substantially contribute to the so-called conceptual term in the sound art. Sound art seems less esoteric in the contemporary new media art environment because of our newfound comport with the immaterial world of pure data and information flowing through the cyberspace. The new media allow for the separation of sounds from their locations and facilitate their travel across globally dispersed networks as digital data and information. Sound is disembodied from its location specificity, falls within multiple layers of mediation across multiple levels of reception and interpretation outside of place, time, and context in a new media environment, whether in an audio streaming network on the internet, a multi-channel sonic environment in, in uh, augmented reality or virtual reality, a telematic performance, or an exhibition in augmented space of an interactive installation work. It is evident that in this space of constant and itinerant flow, 
The production and reception of sound over greater mobility and interactivity lead to its interpretation as a fertile and more alive auditory situation. Rather than being posed as static material of a sonic artifact, Hence, I may assume that sound art is more comfortably discussed within the object unspecific, essentially immaterial and multi multiply interpretative, interpretative media art paradigm. Such positioning of sound art within the contemporary art context is necessary in this talk. So after Giving uh, my perspectives on the history of sound art, I would like to go a few conceptual introductions to my work. First is adaptive perception. According to traditional sound theorists such as Murray Schaeffer, I already mentioned, sound abatement is necessary for a balanced soundscape. However, in my work, I argue that Schaeffer's method is non inclusive in nature and unnecessarily burdened with the idea of oral sanitization and urban pollution. I maintain that it is important for us to hear the fuller spectrum of, of sound, including so-called noise, and incorporate it into our personal experience by adaptive perception, a term I use here for the specific purpose of articulating an approach that suggests that sound pollution or an imbalance in the acoustic ecology of any given urban landscape can be considered as a lack of playful design and aesthetic mediation between sound sources and the human ear. A comprehensive and inclusive understanding of the urban sound environment involving the listener subjectivity is necessary prerequisite to this approach in order to gather knowledge about the sonic character and the ambience of urban sites. When a city becomes a site for artistic interrogation, such as my work, Exile and Other Syndromes, uh, Eligibility, I Contact with the City, uh, in these works, the city becomes a site for artistic interrogation and, and a character. The mimetic representation in these works of a site tends to develop more constructs open for multiple interpretation rather than a fixed soundscape. These constructs are typically a result of intricate interplays between recognition of the site and its abstraction in the compositional stages, utilizing the sounds extensively recorded on the field as compositional ingredients or raw materials. Field recording based sound artworks often transcend the Shepardian notion of the soundscape. These works neither give substantial importance to underscoring the stereotypical sound marks that he coined, sound marks that are uh, representational sound of a location, the stereotypical sounds. So I would argue that uh, these works, uh, sound art works, they don't follow the sound mark approach nor do they intend to enhance the ecological discourse of differentiating between lo-fi and hi-fi environment. Such works, here I would like to give you uh, a little definition of lo-fi if you don't know already. Uh, lo-fi is low fidelity sounds that are technological, mechanical sounds that the urban environment produces every day. And hi-fi sounds that were uh, before industrial revolution took place, the sounds of, let's say, are rural environments. They are clean and not dense enough. So Schaeffer divided between hi-fi sounds and lo-fi sounds are going for a, a kind of ecological adaptation to uh, lo-fi sounds which are emerging continuously as industrial revolution is taking uh, and eating up the hi-fi sounds and hi-fi environments, rural environments, indigenous environments. So uh, I would argue that works which are environmentally concerned, they encourage an adaptive and intersubjective interaction with an perception of the site, an approach through which the idea of noise is deconstructed in a more inclusive framework of a composition or sound artwork particularly developed from recording made 
in sight with various social, political, geological, cultural, and anthropological resonances. Second uh, idea is auditory situation. So auditory situation is, is an idea of flux, site-specific sounds that are, um, that are uh, considering the flux, sonic flux that are continuously happening in a place. So challenging the idea of soundscape. It often happens that we become absent-minded or fall into a reverie when listening to certain sounds. So the sounds, don't, they don't remain as mere sounds, the source, like uh, a truck is passing by, so you recognize that it's a sound of a truck, but that sound of a truck may trigger us to memorize something from a, a lost memory, let's say, from a childhood memory. So I'm interested in not in kind of static meaning-making process of a sound source, but what they do, uh, these sound sources, emergent sound sources in the everyday environment, what they do uh, in our memory, our associative thoughts, our contemplation. So auditory situation is the idea around this flux idea, not, not catered to the idea of soundscape, but a sonic flux. Object disorientation uh, just departs from the idea of auditory situation. To understand object disorientation behavior of sound, uh, we need to go back to the idea of sound object, what it means, and uh, how we can reinterpret the idea of the relationship between sound and object. Uh, the idea of sound object was turned by Pierre Schaeffer uh, during his coinage, uh, his using of the term called music concrete. He coined sound object or object sonore, which paved the way for a new kind of perception, acousmatic listening. Acousmatic listening emerged from the idea that uh, when you record sound from a location and take it back to the studio, it becomes a sound object. To Sheffer, the sound object was an intentional representation of sound to its listener. With the rise of audio technologies, the sound objects recorded on magnetic tape or other media were no longer referred to a sound source. Hence, a new exploration of the acousmatic experience of sound that one hears without seeing the causality behind them. The emphasis here was on the reduced listening state instead of causal listening, if we borrow Michel Sion's terminology. The problem here was the imposition of the word object over sound. The in intrinsic flaw in reduced listening, as Schaeffer conceptualized it, in the theory of sound object was that it assumed that sound had an a priori ontological foundation that was separate and distinct from any cultural or historical or even personal association it might have subsequently acquired. According to scholars such as Joanna Demers, this assertion is problematic on both practical and theoretical counts. Listeners indeed have difficulty hearing sounds divorced from their associations. But at the same time, it is nearly impossible for the human listening faculty not to ascribe a multiplicity of causes to a, a single sonic phenomenon occurring in one place, for example. Furthermore, in practice, the listener is almost certain to simultaneously create imagined gestures or link a sound to its illusory myriad of evoking some kind of contemplative and thoughtful imagery in this process. So what I emphasize here by coining the term sound, object disorientation of sound or object disorientation is a shift in attention away from everyday numbed in attention to sound objects to a careful and concentrated attention to sounds and their resonating, affecting qualities. In short, a listening to the piece of how rather than the immediate what is of sound. This spatial attention can be achieved by being mindful of sounds fluid movements from one state to the other. Maybe we can move to the next slide, sonic subject. We can actually go through all the slides one by one, and okay. then uh, we can stop at uh, 
post immersion which i'll go a little deeper because we don't have much time uh, today somehow so instead of we will just go through the propositions here one by one then we stop at post immersion and then i delineate the idea of post immersion that i develop in my work Uh, maybe I could read them out if um, that helps. So we're at the sonic subject now. Um, oh, sorry. And then the next one is hyper listening. Auto curating. Um, auto curating. Sonic presence. Site specific sound slash remoteness. Auditory setting. Post immersion. Yeah, post immersion. So I'd like to, uh, given the time constant today, I'd like to focus on post-immersion, the idea of post-immersion. Post-immersion. Uh, immersion is often a fetishized term in the domain of contemporary sound and media art. It is through immersion that the audience is often made to engage with the artworks especially those involving multi-channel sound, visuals, and special practices. The rapid emergence of multi-channel sounds, multi-channel surround sound in commercial film, music, and corporate media experience was possible due to its reliance on the medial dispositive of immersion to surround the audience audiovisually. In these works, immersion operates as a strategy to realizing the production of an illusion of non-mediation, where the presence of the technology and the medial devices are made to appear as obtrusive as possible, as to sustain a smooth and engaging entertainment. Etymologically, the word immersion suggests a plunging or dipping into something or an absorption in some interest or situation. And when applied to some spaces, offers the idea that a person who enters such a space will be transformed. Immersion suggests the idea that a space, through its multitude of architectural, material, performative, and technological mediation, may wrap up or envelop an audience within it. The ability to immerse an individual who opens up the ears to its environments is related to its multi-sensorial modes in terms of the constructed narr narratives that are involved often in a suppression of a conscious subjective formation. I consider the immersive spaces that inherently involve context of a consumerist or commercial nature, such, a, such as sound diffusion in a live multi-channel performance in a commercially funded festivals or a com commissioned interactive sound artwork or sound design for a commercial film or virtual reality work, there is a dubious power relationship between the producer and the consumer of the immersive works that are mediated and purpose designed so as to overwhelm and overpower the audience in order to convey and transmit directed information and knowledge of a consumer's nature. This is uh, not only uh, in consumerist uh, or commercial works, but in different degree, immersion exists in all kinds of sound works. Um, so I'm just taking one particular extreme uh, of that example, consumers or commercial films, for example, or VR works. This is a fundamental problem in immersion, embedded in immersion, the idea of immersion, given the times we live in. When the analytical faculty of a subject is most needed for awareness to contemporary issues, if we approach immersion emphasizing the often glorified design and experiential side of a space and disregard the research analytical capacity of an individual experiencing it, we might err on the side of open thinking and discourse. In fact, we should ask critically why immersion is viewed as a positive entity in a philosophical and conceptual sense. This is a make-believe fantasy land where the real is always hidden in order to create pleasure. The main concern here, however, is whether the audience tends to become a passive and non-acting guest within the immersive space 
often constructed by an authoritarian and technocratic consumer corporate culture. In this mode of non-activity, the audience may lose the motivation to question the content and the context of the work by falling into a sensual and indulgent mode of experience, therefore rendering the consumerist corporate power to take over the free will of the audience. As a result, the audience may succumb to the enveloping and engulfing power of a fantasy, fantasy world created by the creative industry with economic, political, or other hegemonic intentions. From the position of a socially and environmentally conscious sound and media artist myself, I'll argue for producing a more discursive environment rather than an immersive one. In the contemporary sound art, artworks that will be conceived and produced in the future, I will fervently demand a discursive space where the individuality and the questioning faculty of the audience is carefully considered and encouraged and taken into account as a parameter for a successful dissemination of the work. Here, discursive situation is a term that underlines the contemplative processes triggered by an artwork to interlink the artistic object and the listener's mind that apprehends it. In such a discursive mode, a sound artwork can become more socially committed, responsible, responsive, and respectful towards the our subjectivity of the audience member and the mindful context within which the artistic experience is formed. However, many of the previous and current sound works still tend to glorify immersion as a dominant mode of production, diffusion and experience. Such as uh, in the screen, you can see some images from Rio G. Keda's work, a very well-known sound artist. To conclude my talk, uh, inspired by Willem Flusser's notion of homeland and homelessness, I suggest four different approaches to disrupt the mode of immersion in sound art. One uh, first is use of environmental sound or noise as an alarm mechanism. Second is asynchronism, a divorce between sound and image. Analogous to the asynchronous mode of cinema as proposed by uh, Pudokin. Third, is disrupting the narrative flow with some discursive element, like poetic interventions, critical commentaries, contemplative moment in a stream of thought or poetic utterances. And the fourth is participatory intervention of the audience to activate the sound artwork. As you have seen in uh, Dhoni project that I clip from, uh, also the some other sound artworks that I produce, there, a few of those approaches are incorporated, such as using environmental sound as an alarm mechanism for sound awareness. I also work in my VR works with asynchronism, where sound and image, they don't sync. So uh, through this disjuncture between uh, sound and image, the audience can intervene and have a uh, critical faculty emerging. I also use poetic uh, um, interpretation of my work, continuously uh, injecting poetic moments uh, in my live performances from ex Exile and Other Syndromes, for example. So in my work, I have continuously responding to the idea of post-immersion and finding different methods and approaches to respond and produce uh, an experience which is uh, not uh, so focused on immersion, but rather a discursive element uh, within which the audience, the individual listener or the individual audience, his or her uh, subjectivity is respected. This is where I would like to stop. Uh, we can uh, open the floor for questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you for such a comprehensive lecture. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in being very bowled over by the sheer amount and of hard work you seem to
to have done in the past few years with all these different works and exhibitions and books and essays <laughs> um yeah really brilliant and i think much um much is really thought provoking in the questions that you um have kind of let us into what guides your practice so about artistic research and um really relevant i think to the things that we learn um and teach at lcc uh, sand arts um i think that's quite a alive and um, quite provocative actually statement at the end which I hope there will be some um, responses to from the audience um, so yeah we've got about 15 minutes for um, some questions to put Aditya um, does anybody want to start I know Margarita um, are you back would you like to Okay, Will has got a question. Margarita um, had wrote me a question before. I don't know if you want to come on and turn on your microphone and ask it, or I can read out what you wrote to me earlier. Um, okay, maybe I'll just read it out. Um, so a question from um, Margarita, who uh, is a former, um, I think, um, MA sound art student um, and she says um, that she loves your conceptual approach to sound work um, but wanted to ask you about techniques and ways of sound processing um, so this was asked towards the beginning I guess when you're presenting quite a few works um, using environmental sounds or sound recordings um, so I guess it's a question about um, your techniques of sound processing Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not very much focused on the technique itself. It depends on the kind of uh, process I go through. Uh, this process is often contingent. And often I go to recording in the field and then I leave the recording for years to kind of generate uh, dust on it. Then after years of forgetting about the recordings because in this forgetting sense of forgetting i disentangle myself from the emotive associations through which i have been recording those locations so they uh, i would like to treat the sounds as, as mere objects so after years of leaving them aside i come back to those recordings and re-listen to them a number of re-listening happens and through this re-listening i would like to relate to them once again and those memories through which uh, I associate them I, in terms of my recording and re-listening, reproduction. I develop a methodology of, uh, of a particular way of dealing with this re-listening. Often that manifests in a, in a studio composition or sometimes in public art or sometimes in a generative uh, composition or sometimes in a very special sculpture like object sometimes uh, so different forms they are generated through this temporal disjuncture between listening re-listening and composing so in when it comes to treatment uh, if you are asking me about the technological intervention i make in the compositions i would say that i often like to re relate reconnect with those locations through processes such as in uh, exile and other syndromes and also in uh, elegy for bangalore uh, i try to use delay uh, to simulate the special kind of natural specialization that that takes place in a city let's say you are in a high rise you're on a top floor and you are listening to the city and the sound of the city is coming to you through different surfaces reflected so it is carrying different kinds of natural delay so when i compose with urban sounds i often use delays which are very natural like so this kind of memory associations coming back and forth between recording and uh, forgetting uh, th these are contingent moments of a composing work, compositional processes. If that responds to your question, yeah. 
Great. Um, Will, your question, I don't know if you want to come on the mic yourself or you want me to read it out. If your microphone's working, I'm happy to read it out. If I've made, I think I've enabled you to speak if you want to. Um, okay, no worries. I will, I'll kind of paraphrase it. So Will has written, thank you so much for your talk. Um, and that he's very excited for your books um, and very uh, a big fan of the errant bodies. Um, oh, you were talking. Would you like to come and talk? Well, you just have to turn on the mic if you can. Perhaps it's not working. OK, <laughs> all right, I'll carry on. Um, you're most welcome to come and speak, but in your absence, I will continue. OK, it doesn't seem to be working. So he, uh, Will is asking, in your work, Elegy for Bangalore, um, the use of very industrial field recordings, digitalized recordings of folk songs and electronic manipulation of these elements suggests and conjures to me at least multiple temporal planes. I hear the various surfaces, not just those of urbanized surfaces, but of an analog playback surface, and then in brackets, folk song recordings and digital surface, brackets, stereo delay, etc. These various simultaneous scales result in a sort of speculative space or hyperreal augmentation of the narratives you document in the work. And it's an approach to this sort of sound work I have not come across before and one which I really enjoy. My question is then, when working with field recordings of place, space, especially those which are contested, there can be a fine, messy and possibly problematic line between using these recordings to A, represent place or space, B, augment some of the characteristics in the place or space, or C, use or using them as raw material to another end. Um, I know you touched upon it a little bit in your talk, but I'm wondering if you can briefly talk on the line between the approaches, how you consider it within your work, and how you decide when and how to traverse that line. Well, that's a very, very interesting, uh, long, elaborate question. Thank you, Will. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I responded a bit in, in my earlier, um, earlier response to this question of digital and physical and uh, compositional different layers of mediation. What I'm interested in, uh, in while working with field recordings is the blurry intersection between representation and abstraction. Because uh, I argued in my writings that often the documentation or documenting a recording of a site is not interesting until and unless it affects the audience, the listener. To create this affective dimension in a composition, uh, I would like to uh, create a blurry intersection between representation and abstraction, because this is the moment when an, a listener can intervene. I, uh, until and unless a listener is triggered to intervene, it's not effective uh, in a sense. So uh, I keep those compositions open for listener to intervene, always. And this in this disjuncture is created in the composition by uh, creating different disjunctures, such as digital surfaces, and as you mentioned uh, clearly, and uh, physical surfaces, and the way recording mediates locations continuously. And I also use different recording media, such as um, MD recorder, uh, cassette recorders, digital recorders, high end and low end, so that a place is mediated in multiple uh, possibilities and through different uh, layers of mediation creates a sense of disjuncture and a kind of uh, abstract, mysterious uh, overtone. Uh, this is uh, my way of dealing with field recording in general because they create hybrid spaces. Uh, the reality is often diluted, or maybe not diluted as such, but they're presented in, in an augmented sense. 
And this augmentation or this enhancement of their effect is done through the compositional process uh, through which the effect is generated, affect uh, in, the, in the listener's mind. And uh, so that the location, narrative of the location is registered and, and, and keep traces in the mind of the listener. Thank you for that answer. Does any, uh, Will says thanks so much, much to think about, and he will consider to, he will consider this when he really listens to your work. Um, would anyone else like to ask Buddhaditya a question? Just put your hand up, and I can um, enable your microphone. Um, okay, if there's none, I will. Oh, Esther. Yeah. Um, so Esther, you should be able to turn on your mic and camera if you wish. Huh. Is it not working very well? Um, Esther, I'm afraid we can't hear you. If you are, that's okay. You can write your question there if you'd like to. Seems to perhaps be a few issues if Will also couldn't speak. Okay, yep. Yeah. Just give Esther, I guess, a few moments to type out um, the question. Um, I'll just fill the space by saying I really agree with this, um, the fetishization of immersivity <laughs> and the kind of, I guess, the general, the focus on um, multi-channel audio almost as a kind of, yeah, the dominant paradigm right now, um, or one of, one, of, one of a few dominant paradigms right now in, in sound arts. Um, okay, so Esther's question, I'm going to read this out. Thank you for the presentation, but it here. You have a magnificent collection of eclectic mixed media sound projects and sound arts. In the last section, you mention post-immersion, um, perceptive experience in sound, play or performance. How does psychoacoustics, uh, I guess, how is psychoacoustics involved in your music process? Uh, thank you for the question. Um... I'm not very much equipped to respond to the idea of psychoacoustics. Uh, it is a subject uh, I'm not very uh, I'm not very adept in it. The idea of psychoacoustics and the theories of psychoacoustics. Although I was developing an interest, but um, the the scientific approach with which we generate ideas around the uh, brain and the perception of sound didn't interest me at the time. But what I can uh, tell you is that there is an intuitive space for composition with sound. And this intuition is something deeply personal and contingent and open-ended. This is something where I, I exist. I don't approach, uh, although I mentioned that in uh, Well Tempered City, I measured uh, using a measuring instrument, I, I recorded sound, but that was very subjective interaction with surfaces, urban surfaces. So I don't know if I have any psychostic approach to working with sound or music, but it's a more contingent, subjective, intersubjective uh, approach that I, uh, I take in my work. Thank you, Buddhichi, and thank you, Esther, for the question. Um, if there's no more questions from the audience, then maybe I'll ask one that we can. We should probably close on as we're um, approaching 4:30. But I suppose I really wanted to ask um, about this question of kind of sound arts and the global south. Um, you mentioned that your work, Exile and Other Syndromes, was kind of a reflection of, of 12 years of living in Europe. Um, and um, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Anna. Um, and you mentioned, yeah, obviously, kind of your own 
upbringing and at the very beginning you mentioned that story of um, your house being flooded and learning about sand through cleaning the the reel-to-reel -reel tapes and, and vinyls um, and you know the reason we came into contact a few years ago was because both of us had uh, cited um, senior white male academics within the field of sound studies and we'd both been on the receiving end of some quite defensive responses uh, in very separate situations but I think what that reveals is um, I guess certain yeah lineages as you alluded to in your um, set of questions about sound art that you know these are very Eurocentric these are very white heteronormative male dominated um, discourses and histories um, but it is very often hard to bring in any other perspectives so you you know I know that you know um, Kathy Lane and Angus Carlyle and the Chris App Center at LCC um, and the kind of I guess the feminist critique of sound arts has um, been quite well enacted um, at LCC with the Hanoi's archive and so on um, so I think the way I see it and you know, in teaching, we often frame this as, you know, a quite a longer battle, let's say, in terms of diversifying, opening up um, to, to other perspectives that have maybe previously been excluded. Um, but my question is, um, how much do you think that sound art has to be in the gallery? So in your set of questions, you're referring to sound. Can sound be exhibited as an artistic object? Um, and I was wondering how much you still think it needs to be in the gallery or what kind of other spaces are you, or are you interested in exploring other spaces that are not kind of specifically art spaces? Uh, it's a very long question. Uh, thank you for uh, mentioning uh, the kind of male uh, Eurocentrism that is permeating in sound and studies in general, sound art exhibition curation as such. Although we are also experiencing an emerging uh, voices that are uh, global in nature, like researchers and artists from global south, they are also showing their faces that I exist or we exist. So that is kind of reconfiguring the dynamics, and that is uh, a hope for me. Uh, I, I belong to this emerging coalescing between global north and south and not by like revenging, taking a revenge on Eurocentrism, but advocating for more uh, diversity and dialogue, conversation, reciprocity between different traditions. Uh, this is something I, I would like to further research and uh, kind of create an advocacy in my book connecting resonances and this is kind of committed to that question and when it comes to sound art in uh, gallery spaces i think all sound art is already creating a huge huge problem in contemporary art world uh, curators are at a loss how to deal with sound art in the gallery museum dominated space so there are a number of occasions where public art uh, is becoming like a more more appropriate venue for holding sound art exhibitions if there is any sound art exhibition as such They're always coming with visual representation so in future public uh, sound art we may see a, a rise in remote exhibitions kind of multiply uh, uh, divided locations and uh, network performances, network exhibitions. So uh, there's a huge public sphere waiting for sound art to explore them, you know, not only the physical public sites, but also distributed, dispersed digital public spheres. So th this is, on this note, uh, I think I, I should end this response to your question. Thank you. 
Thanks so much. Well, we are already over time, so I'm sure everyone would join me in thanking Buddhaditya for a really wonderful talk and for sharing your work. Um, I'm sure we've got a lot. I, I was posting links in the chat so people can go back um, and listen and watch the video and audio clips in your own time. Um, so I'm afraid with virtual lectures, we can't give you a round of applause, so we just have to imagine it. <laughs> uh, just to one, uh, one, one uh, clarification, because of the internet connection bandwidth, some technical glitches uh, happened. So perhaps in the recording, you can compensate for, the, for those glitches, such as replacing with original clips or cleaning some of the voices or I'm sure infertile pauses, for example. Yeah, sure. I'm sure um, Michael and our wonderful technicians will facilitate that. OK, thank you so much for joining us, Buddhaditya. And thanks, everyone. And thank you for your questions. So see you all next week. OK, bye, everyone.